Welcome to Politics and Tactics on the Hump Day Hangout today. It's a, we have a great show for you. Uh, Bobby Halton, our editor-in-chief, is here. P.J. Norwood, the director of Connecticut's Fire Academy. And I'm going to call this show Lawyers, Guns, and Money. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about the law. We're going to talk about things going on with Forever Chemicals and give you the full story of what's out there. We're also going to be talking to Chief Brian Sky Eagle. I got a B in my face about what's going on with the Houston Fire Chiefs Association. Brian's also a lawyer. And we're going to start off by talking about a very important lawsuit. And it's important that our viewers get the whole picture. And we're going to be talking about firefighters who have cancer that filed an action. This show allows all views. So we're going to invite on Lion and the chemical companies to say their part as well in the future. But it's important that we get this information out so firefighters know what's going on across the country. It's an honor to have Jonathan Levine here and Rick Seal. And Jonathan, if you could just explain a little bit about your law firm and what's going on with these forever chemicals, firefighter cancer. And this isn't just a California issue. This is an issue that's facing firefighters across the country. We're talking groundwater. We're talking a triple F foam, and we're talking about firefighter gear. Uh, Jonathan, welcome to the show. Uh, and thanks for having me, uh, Frank, and hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, we're a, a small litigation firm headquartered in the Bay Area in California. We have an office in New York as well. Rick is uh, one of the lawyers uh, with our firm who joined uh, about a year ago, uh, specifically because of his uh, firefighter expertise and background. He is a former former uh, fire captain from San Jose. Um, so we were approached about a year ago by some retired firefighters who, had, who both had been diagnosed with cancer and wanted us to investigate whether there were links between, uh, they, had, they had seen some news reports about you know, the forever chemicals and the foam, and they wanted us to investigate whether or not there was a link between their illnesses and the uh, and you know their service in their firefighter service, so we we undertook a fairly lengthy uh, investigation, took most of a year, uh, you know, spearheaded by Rick and some others in our firm, uh, which coincidentally timed pretty well with some of the studies that came out uh, by by Notre Dame and some of the others on the turnout gear. And uh, we prepared a complaint uh, on their behalf. Uh, during that process, about 20, I think about 22 other firefighters from the Bay Area came on board. We had them all tested to determine their PFAS levels uh, for the various PFAS chemicals. Uh, and then we filed a complaint in state court in California on their behalf against the manufacturers and distributors of the Class B AFFF foam and the turnout gear that they're wearing, or I, I guess in the East Coast, some people call it bunker gear, um, because both the AFFF foam and the turnout gear, uh, as it turns out, obviously contain uh, the PFAS chemicals. Um, so uh, that is sort of the, and, and there we believe and we allege in this complaint and in others that we've filed since on behalf of other firefighters that the injuries that the firefighting, the illnesses, the cancers, the tumors, the other serious illnesses the firefighters have suffered uh, is caused substantially or, or wholly uh, by the PFAS chemicals in the foam that they used and the turnouts that they wore during their service. So that's sort of the case in a nutshell, you know, a very brief nutshell. Now, Jonathan, you said something that, that I think we need to highlight here that a lot of firefighters don't understand. So your clients aren't just individuals that were firefighters that happen to have cancer. Your firm went the extra level to measure the, I like calling them forever chemicals because it's a huge family, to measure that in their actual bloodstream. Did I hear that correctly? That, that's correct. So we're not, you know, we're not doing medical monitoring cases. We're not, it's not simply any firefighter who is ill. Uh, it's specifically 
we, we are looking at and filing cases on behalf of firefighters who have already been diagnosed with fairly serious illnesses um, and who had elevated levels of the forever chemicals in their body. Um, so we have been testing the firefighters and, you know, so far all, all of them have tested at higher levels. Now, when you say medical monitoring, I think a lot of people are familiar when we had Rob Bellano, and that's when they look at a large population and they're looking for individuals that get sick. You're kind of, it's, this is something different. They are already sick and now you're, you're looking for confirmation. You do a test for their blood. Could you tell us, I mean, I know that you're not a doctor, but for the firefighter out there, I already know that I'm going to be getting questions. Is that a, is that a test that a firefighter can get when they start the job or when they retire, or is this something that's pretty complex? Uh, it, unfortunately, it's not, it's not something that can get, you know, I hope, and I think we hope that as a result of some of these lawsuits and sort of the increased public awareness of this, that the tests will become more and more available and cheaper and more common. But, but right now um, it's, it's not publicly available. They are expensive. I mean, we are we are testing through a uh, university, the California hospital, University of California, San Francisco Hospital, and it's a whole test protocol. It's very expensive. We have to have a minimum of twenty five firefighters each time we test. Um, it it's fairly time consuming. It takes several months to to process each batch. Um, but they have a very rigid protocol in place and we're, we're confident because they've done testing of other firefighters before, which is why we use them for other studies. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's a long and, it, you know, we wish it was available to everyone and they could go in sort of like a, you know, a quick COVID test kind of thing and get a swab. But it, unfortunately, right now it's not. Bobby, you got a question? Jump in. Yeah, just because I know... Um... A cancer survivor myself, obviously, uh, not obviously, but I am. And quick question, if, in order to get a group together, Jonathan, to be tested, what are there parameters that you're looking for, like uh, having served at a similar time or in, in a single department or, or, or if a firefighter wanted to be tested, is there a way to get into a group uh, that, that you know of? Uh, you know, there are we've sort of heard through the grapevine that there are some other entities testing. We don't know what their protocols are. We don't know how expensive they are. What we heard is they're more expensive than what we're doing. Um, this, the company, the entity we're doing, it's not a profit thing. They're just covering their costs for a study, you know, for study purposes. Um, so, you know, I mean, short of contacting us, obviously, and us setting up testing for people. I mean, we, we've typically, before we test people, we want to know whether they have a serious injury. We're not just testing for the sake of testing um, because, you know, it's, it's expensive and time consuming. But uh, so I guess the first step is, does somebody have an illness that's man, does a firefighter and Rick, I don't know, in terms of years of service, we have active firefighters, we have retired firefighters in terms of years of service. Do we have an average of, of in terms of all of our clients of sort of how long they've served? Yes, John, we do. And um, we do have active and retired guys. And I would say the average length of service is over 25 years. And, and obviously, you know, the landscape has changed a lot over that time in terms of people's use of the phones, people's turnout, where, how they wear the turnouts and how often, you know, and, and it, that also depends on, you know, where they work and what the local practice is. Some when we first started the case, we thought it was more, we thought we were focused more on the phone because the phone had a lot more, there was a lot more information out there and there were lawsuits on the groundwater contamination. And some firefighters don't have that much exposure to phone. Um, it's infrequent or it's during training or, um, but as it turns out, obviously, fair firefighters have a lot of exposure to turnout gear, which they pretty much wear all the time. Um, and it rubs off in, in the firehouse, it rubs off where they're, wherever they park that turnout gear, it's on their chairs, it's on their bed and firehouse, you know, it can be anywhere. Um, and that, that's common to everyone as it turns out. John, 
Frank, can I jump in here with a question? Absolutely. So, so John, and I don't think anybody on this call doubts that, you know, these forever chemicals live in our gear, uh, but we also are smart enough to know that they live in our society, all right? Pretty much everything that we come in contact with today. So it's not just our, tur our turnout gear. How do you decipher if, if you were to test me today that my exposure is from my 30 years of wearing turnout gear versus it's my 46 years of life being exposed to normal daily living? How are you deciphering the difference between that exposure? That, that, that's a good question. You know, that's something we, we looked at. So what we're comparing, so when we get back the results, there's a benchmark. So there was a study done of general populations. It's called the NHANES study. And they've done studies every, and, and this may have been discussed when Mr. Balot was on, um, they've done sort of benchmark studies of the general population as to what their levels are of certain, certain of the forever chemicals, not all of them. Um, and we can test against that. So that's the general population. So we know uh, what the general population in certain areas is in terms of their general numbers. And we, what we look for is levels that are elevated above those numbers, um, because that would be the general population. Now, just, sort of parenthetically, we, we did test some of the spouses of some of our firefighters to see, you know, is it a home exposure? Is it through water or something like that? And the spouses tested lower than the, than the firefighters. Was so that would suggest to us that it's coming from the work. So was that clear across the board where there was a clear difference between spouses and firefighters or were there some firefighters and spouses in the mix that had a similar benchmark level? Um, not that I mean, we haven't tested all the spouses. We only tested a few. Um, some of the we have some spouses who are clients as well for loss of consortium claims. So we tested those. Um, their numbers were lower. Um, so we haven't tested everyone, but the firefighters all have at least some levels above the NHANES levels, the, the last set of NHANES numbers, which I think were from four or five years ago. Bobby? Jonathan, Rick, is there a type of um, cancer or ailment that you found to be more prevalent to exposure to these forever chemicals that a firefighter who's had should be um, perhaps interested in, in contacting your office or, or finding um, remedy? Rick, I'll let you take that one. Uh, thank you, Bobby. Um, we have approximately over 80 firefighters now that we're representing, and the majority of the cancers we're seeing of those are prostate cancer. Now, recognize, as you guys talked about before, that the C8 um, um, science panel that came out, uh, they have made correlations to other cancers, specifically testicular cancer, kidney cancer, thyroid cancer, and ulcerative colitis. But recognize also that was just from one uh, PFOS analyte, and there's approximately depends where you read from seven to 9,000. So with that said, um, we have, we're representing multiple cancers, but the predominant one is um, prostate. But we're seeing the, the classic or the correlated cancers with PFOS, uh, testicular cancer, kidney cancers, and we do have uh, thyroid cancers. That would probably be the next batch of people um, we're seeing in our cancers. And lastly, uh, the blood cancers and lymphomas. So we're we're representing quite a range of these cancers, uh, but the, again, the correlation is um, with prostate right now. Rick, you went from firehouse kitchen table lawyer to lawyer. Um, if, if it's okay, could you tell our viewers where you work? Because I think it's important that they realize that you were a firefighter. Yeah, so I was hired in San Jose Fire Department in 1990. And then I uh, promoted to captain and I was captain for about a decade. And then I finished my career as battalion chief. And then I retired as battalion chief to take the California bar. And so as I was working, I went to school um, probably 15 years from my undergrad to get my law degree. Um, and it's the only point of that uh, as being a firefighter talking about this issue. Um, I had no idea what PFOS was. I, I had never heard of it. Um, I knew that cancer was relevant in the fire service because my colleagues were dying and friends were dying in the San Jose Fire Department, as all fire departments. But I really didn't have no idea what PFOS was until I got involved in this case. And then once involved in this litigation, um, it, it's really apparent 
that just connecting the dots, this is a significant issue for the fire service and these uh, PFAS is a significant problem to the fire service. And so I'm forever grateful for you and uh, fire engineering to shed light on this and Jonathan Levine and his law firm to really tackle this head on because this needs to be addressed. Rick, as a captain, you know, as a long serving member of the fire service and now being on the on the other side as a lawyer, specifically dealing with this issue, um, how would you handle this question? I commonly get here from firefighters. When I signed up and I, I put my hand up and I swore to protect, I knew the risk. I knew cancer was a risk. I knew that was part of the job. So I don't know what the problem is now. All right. So how do you address that that firefighter or that officer that says, listen, I, I know the risk. I signed up knowing that can cancer was a problem. So how would you address that uh, with your experience now on both sides as a lawyer and as a retired captain? I'll, I'll speak uh, just for myself. And uh, I agree with the assumption of risk that we do take a risk as firefighters. And the risk I took was I'd be I'm willing to burn to death. I'm willing to get crushed. I'm willing to go and get exposed to um, disease, that was all part of it. That was the known risk. And I can mitigate that through my training and experience and, and uh, at least mitigate this. This for me is fundamentally different because I believe that we were lied to. I believe that the manufacturers and the, um, of the PFOS and the turnout companies and the foam companies knew exactly what this chemical was and they didn't tell us. And so I thought, I believe we were lied to. And so we didn't take on that risk because we were, um, fundamentally deceived for decades and decades and decades. If they were told us what's in this chemicals and what they could do to us, we as firefighters would manage that risk appropriately, but we weren't afforded that opportunity. Rick, uh, very well said. Brian had a question, but before we go to Brian real quickly, I think it's important for our viewers to realize that these forever chemicals, they aren't found in a mine. Like we hear about talcum powder being in a vein of asbestos, and getting into the product. These forever chemicals were manufactured by man. So the fact that they're in everybody's bloodstream is a little disconcerting. And as somebody who is very much for the free market and for reduced regulation in a true capitalist society, um, one of the controls is litigation, is the courts for contract. And when people are harmed, it actually helps the free market move forward. Um, Brian, you're in a, you're in a, a tough, Tough situation here, but I got to go to the editor in chief first, and then we'll go to Brian Sky Eagle. Go ahead, chief. I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood what Rick just said because we have assumed risk. But what Rick just said was that he believes through his work that people knew about the dangers, knew about the potential consequences, and failed to inform people of them because some of these chemicals were put in, albeit with the best of intention, to prevent us from absorbing other contaminants and things like that, waterproofing, et cetera, et cetera. And at the time, may they may not have known, but once, once you have knowledge of the fact that it could harm someone, you have an obligation to let them know that. And, and I, if I understood you correctly, Rick, and correct me if I'm wrong, you believe and Jonathan believe that, that there, was, there, was, there was knowledge of and an effort to suppress the dissemination of that knowledge so others could take precautions. Did I say that correctly? I mean, that's certainly, there's certainly plenty of evidence. It's in, a lot of it's in our complaints um, with respect to the foam. I think it's still, because the turnout angle is really new, um, I think that's still coming, that's still to be developed um, in terms of what the knowledge of the turnout people were. But certainly with respect to the foam, there's a long history of what the foam manufacturers knew and what they what they you know hid from pretty much everyone in the public, including all the firefighters. Um, I've all you know I think we've all heard stories that you know they used to let kids have foam days at the firehouse and let kids play in the foam. You know, right? Yeah, everyone, and I, we've heard that from lots of firefighters in lots of different departments. So um, uh, that may be a little horrifying now, but you know, and and. That may, may be where the turnout angle goes. I mean, we were the first complaint filed, as far as we know, anywhere in the country that sued the turnout manufacturers and alleged that the forever chemicals were both present and sloughing off and impacting firefighter health through turnout here. And we may still be the only 
uh, complaints in the country on that issue. So it's a very new issue and it's still to be developed, but I think the science is gonna get there pretty quickly. And there is some already, obviously, from like the Notre Dame study. I think there's another study in Arizona. So there's more and more focus being put on the turnout gear because obviously firefighters wear that, you know, for, for hours and hours on end. Um, so if they need to be taking precautions on their turnout gear, that's something we want to know sooner rather than later. Chief Sky Eagle, you had a question? Yeah, Jonathan actually is leading it right to it. So we've had both uh, our firefighters, airport rescue, dealing with the phone. And as this issue has gained more um, awareness, we've had other people ask us about that. What the apprehension is, they don't quite know who to trust. They don't quite know who to talk to. And some people will call up saying, hey, come test over here or come talk to this guy. And I just kind of wanted you guys' as guidance on what we can tell our members um, about when they approach this subject and they think that they, because we've had ARF guys talk, you know, that, that had prostate cancer and they're asking me, how would they know that? How would these lawyers know that? How would that, and they approach them. I think it's where they're at. But if you could just shed some light on us of what we can tell our guys and, and, and gals about um, who do you talk to about this if they feel they want to take it further? Well, I mean, we do a fairly extensive sort of vetting. We talk about, you know, family histories, obviously, did they smoke, did they drink, uh, other avenues of exposure, is there, is there any family history, when did they develop the illness as opposed to when they were in their service, um, you know, for example, some, we had a firefighter who had ulcerative colitis when they, you know, a year after they started, which is probably in service, which is probably not a, a strong connection um, as opposed to having been there for 20 years or something like that. Um, so, you know, I, they should talk to their doctors. They should maybe talk to lawyers. I mean, in terms of the studies, um, you can't trust the people who are selling you the product because they're selling you stuff. Um, but there are independent peer review studies out there on both the chemicals, the foams, and the turnout gear. Um, they're, you know, they're not easy to find, but there's more and more information being made available publicly about this, about the foam and the turnouts um, from people who have no vested interest in one way or the other. The Notre Dame study, for example, is a independent peer reviewed study of turnout gear um, by, you know, people who are just after the truth. They don't have a, a dog in this fight one way or the other. They just want to know, are these chemicals in the turnout gear used and new turnout gear or not? And, you know, they did a study and they've reached their conclusions and other studies are underway. So the safest place to look, what we're relying on is, you know, the hard facts and the scientific studies um, and our clients' stories, um, and not on, you know, denials by manufacturers and things like that. So we just don't, you know, you know, no defendant has ever, and I've been practicing for 30 years and I've never sued a defendant that, that, you know, after we were sued said, yep, you got me. I admit everything, you know, the standard response is it wasn't us. We didn't do it and we didn't do anything wrong. And if, even if we did, it was a mistake. Sorry. Rick, what's the status of the lawsuit now? That is a, a giant question. Um, so this litigation, as Jonathan mentioned, was in state court and uh, through some procedures of the federal system, we were pulled in federal court and we were merged with a um, massive litigation that's going on. Uh, it's the um, AFFF multi-district litigation. And that's comprised of... Um, my guess is hundreds, probably maybe thousands of individual litigants all suing the uh, manufacturers of the uh, foam and the um, chemical manufacturer. So that has been ongoing and we anticipate that litigation to go on for several more years. And so our piece of this is that we got um, absorbed in that. And this is for the pre-trial phase of this. Um, and so we are in that mix. The upside to that is, is that Pritzker and Levine has assumed a position of leadership in there. So we'll be 
um, looking over the firefighter aspect of the science part of it. Um, so a long way to answer your question is that we're probably five years down the road before we see results and that would be um, optimistic. But we're in a pretrial phase. We're in a pretrial phase as we speak, um, sorting out. Yeah, just to follow up on what Rick said, the, those cases started as groundwater contamination cases near military bases and airports. Um, and that part of the case, the groundwater contamination cases are being litigated first. Um, and once and while once those are sort of work their way through a little, they'll turn to the personal injury cases, which include all the firefighter cases. Uh, our firm in particular, we have three complaints on file in the Bay Area. We are preparing to file three more complaints in the Bay Area. And then we also are working on complaints in New York and Massachusetts. Um, on behalf of firefighters in New York and Massachusetts. And, and it's really about who, who we've been contacted by at critical mass. Now for the federal court system, this is being heard pre-trial in South Carolina, is that correct? So yeah, we file the cases in the local jurisdictions. Uh, they get removed by the defendants who claim a government contractor defense. Um, the, the defendants are claiming they were required to manufacture this stuff the way they did. It's only for the phone, not the turnouts, because the government told them to, which is not true. But um, And so we're in South Carolina for pretrial purposes, but the cases all go back to their home court for trials, which is important because we want to obviously try the firefighter cases in front in the communities in which the firefighters served. So we want San Jose firefighters to their cases to be heard by a San Jose jury. Uh, and that will happen. Chief Alton. So it raises so many interesting questions. Uh, having started my career <clears throat> um, before PJ was born, apparently, um, which is sad to admit, but we used to use foam um, extensively and we would train with it extensively. So I guess the question becomes on exposure. And I, and I know that um, all of us are so unique individually that uh, you know some people, a, a limited exposure can be very debilitating. Some people can tolerate greater exposures. So I guess if you're a firefighter out there wondering if my exposure to foam, and I'm just speaking about foam specifically now, and, and I trained with it. I used to, we, we literally walked through it like it was snow. We thought it was harmless. We didn't know. We were, we were, like, we were like our dads in World War II when you were smoking to calm your nerves with no idea that you were destroying your lungs. So do you have a sense at this point, uh, you know, Jonathan or Rick, as to how much exposure a firefighter needs to be concerned about? In other words, if it was just limited to training and maybe, you know, a few off exposures, uh, are you not as concerned? I was a training officer and, and I spent, I'll, I'll just be direct, I spent a lot of time in foam. I mean, I. I foamed entire buildings. I foamed blocks of things. I, I played with nozzles to get different, you know, degrees of foam. I did the pit fires, which I know Brian is really familiar with. If, you know, if you've got industrial areas nearby or oil uh, responsibilities, as we did. Um, so I, I wonder if there's a parameter that you could look at to say, well, if you're one off, probably not so much of a concern. But if you were a training officer or if you, you know, spent ex a lot of time uh, covered in foam, you should be concerned. This is one of the confounding factors, which is if it was just foam, I think we can answer that question. We could, we could eventually, science would eventually provide some kind of an answer to that. Uh, the problem is if the turnouts have the chemicals in them as well, and you're always wearing your turnouts, how do you separate the foam contamination from the turnout contamination? And that's, that's sort of what's hard. Um, and we don't know the answer to that yet. Um, so obviously we have fire, yes, some firefighters don't have a lot of exposure to foam um, and some have a lot, um, but everyone has the same exposure to their turnouts. Um, and, you know, going to sort of Rick's, I think that going to the earlier discussion about you know, assumption of the risk, the firefighters join the service and they all know that, you know, they say, okay, I know what I signed up for, right? You know, firefighters have elevated risk of cancer, but that may beg the question, 
why do they have elevated risks of cancer? If they're all wearing turnouts for years on end that have these chemicals in them, maybe that's why. Um, so, you know, it's, yes, there are, obviously firefighters are exposed to all sorts of chemicals and fumes in their daily service, but I think firefighters know at least in the last 10 years or so, you know, they have, they can wear masks, they can wear equipment to, 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 to aid them in that. Um, but what nobody knew until recently or people are learning is the clothing they're wearing. Even if you're wearing a mask, you still have clothing that's itself is contaminating you. So it, we don't know the answer to the levels of contamination yet because we don't know how to separate out the turnout contamination from the foam. What I will say though is apparently the kinds of contamination from the turnouts is different than the foam in terms of the chemicals, the specific chemicals. So apparently there are ways to test. It, it may be slicing it pretty thinly, but there are ways to test for turnout contamination that may or may not be different than foam. It may, it, there may be different markers. Rick, you wanted to jump in, go ahead. I was just going to dovetail on Jonathan's point of the, there may be potential marker space in the short chain, long chain of the PFOS and how you could tell that out. Um, but again, just to reiterate, Jonathan said into uh, what Chief Halton was saying, that the um, just exposure to PFOS in general is dangerous. And it's because of that bond doesn't break and it's persistent. And that we know that the science and the public domain, uh, the public um, research really shows us that at the cellular level, this PFOS is causing problems. So um, I would advocate just minimize your exposure to PFOS at all at, in any manner that we can and really advocate for PFOS free work environment Be because the stuff is the stuff's terrible. In, you know, and, we, and we've done some show, shows in the past, um, and I think that it would be worthwhile kind of revisiting those. I know Chief Fulton has a has a good list, and, and Frank has a good list for some of our our viewers today, are either watching this live or watching this, you know, the download version. You know, in a couple of days or weeks from now, um, we know that these forever chemicals live in our gear, but there are things we could do today to minimize our risk, and minimize our exposure. You know, if your gear has the forever chemicals in it. It is what it is. You need to work with your, you know, to work towards an environment of being forever chemical free, but that's not up to a lot of the line firefighters. They don't have that ability to make that, make that change. So, you know, taking some simple steps of only wearing your gear when absolutely necessary. It's structural firefighting gear. We shouldn't be wearing it going to get the meal. We shouldn't be wearing it just to go down the road for pre-planning or, or building inspections. Think about how you're handling your gear. You know, I don't know if I would put latex free gloves on just to handle my gear to take it from my locker to the piece or off the piece. However, that may be something you want to consider if you're transporting your gear, your clean gear um, in your vehicle for the volunteers out there, put it in a sealed container, right? Try to limit your exposure in any way that you can. But then also on the backside, I think you need to be an advocate within your department and speak to those that are, are specking your gear and specking your turnout and truly looking at what you're wearing. But that's not an overnight fix. But for everybody watching today, there are things that you can do today to begin to decrease your, your level of exposure to forever chemicals. And that is, that is definitely a topic for a full, complete, another show, um, how we limit our exposure and for our viewers, as we know, the International Association of Firefighters has now come on board. Diane dragged him kicking and screaming, but they've come on board and they put forth a proposal to allow the gear manufacturers to have a choice to do a UV test on one of the inner lining so that we could give the manufacturers a choice to go to forever chemical free gear. and. That got voted down initially. Unfortunately, a lot of individuals who have a responsibility on the NFPA committee didn't vote. Um, I can respect everybody. You know, I've been on the side of a Supreme Court case, and then I actually provided testimony for the lawyer that was on the opposite side so he could become a federal judge, which people were blown away. We can disagree about things and still be agreeable, but you, 
but I have a hard time when people don't take positions. So if you're out there and you know an NFPA member, you know, they need to take a position one way or the other. And I think the clear position should be, we should let the free market decide. We should let firefighters have the ability to choose and municipalities to choose doing away with this test and getting gear, moving to gear that is, doesn't have the forever chemicals in it. Um, I just want to thank Jonathan and Rick for coming on today. Um, it's very important that people know what's going on. And I'm going to give uh, Rick, Jonathan, the last word. And if anybody on our distinguished panel here um, would like to ask a last question of them, uh, we really appreciate you coming on and talking to us today. And I, I think it's important that firefighters hear what's going on in the bigger picture. I'll start with uh, the last round of questions, and then we'll give you both the last word. I'll start with PJ. Yeah, Frank, just want to bring up, there's two questions uh, from the chat from the uh, hashtag FE talk that I'll kind of uh, bring into one question and maybe they can, or both our guests can, can answer it. Uh, one is from, um, where do you think this topic will be in one year, five years, and 10 years? Uh, it's another challenge against firefighters that can overwhelm efforts to protect oneself. Um, and then further expanding on that question from the, the same uh, firefighter, they like to know if these forever chemicals are in fire retardant uniforms. Both those questions are from uh, Nick Salome. Well, I'll let Rick ask the second one on the uniforms. I think the answer is yes, but Rick, Rick will know specifics. Um, on the first one, you know, it's, it's developing pretty quickly and the science is moving. There's a lot of testing that's going on. Um, you know, this has become a... I think we, as a society, we're all seeing these articles in the, in the mainstream, not just about the phone, but about the, how bad these chemicals are for everyone. They're in cosmetics, they're in your Teflon pans, they're in your water, anything that's waterproof, if they're in your, your sofas, your carpets. Um, so I think there's going to be a, a general societal push to get rid of these chemicals, which as somebody pointed out are entirely man-made. Um, and there's separately a push, a focused push on, I think, the foam, and there's going to be on the turnout gear. There are a number of studies now underway. People are diving into this and looking at this stuff much more closely. So it's moving pretty quickly. I mean, I think within four or five years, you know, there's going to be a much broader body of science on, on generally on the forever chemicals, but also specifically on the firefighting foams and the turnouts that we hope, you know, will really cast light on this and force the manufacturers. I think it already has started, frankly, uh, to get rid of this stuff and find safer alternatives. Um, so, you know, that's where I think it's going um, uh, pretty quickly. And litigation is what's driving a lot of it. It's lawsuits, unfortunately, you know, uh, is what's going to force change. Our, our case has already started to force change. It's you know turned a light on the turnout manufacturers um, that wasn't there before, and you know that is one of the goals of the litigation, which is to uh, effectuate change to protect future firefighters. So, Rick, on the second question, you want to answer that? Yeah, I just wanted to go and dovetail what you just said, Jonathan. That there's been a lot of people who've done great work to bring us to the forefront, and so we're grateful for that. And litigation is just one piece to that. There's also been uh, work on the legislative front, at least in California here. We just passed a um, state law that um, will demand a PFAS free turnout, and I want to say 2024. And um, so I believe that states are recognizing this and they'll be, have greater protections for firefighters. I also want to say that Michigan is going to uh, start testing all their firefighters for PFAS or they're in discussions to do that. So through uh, the legislation, through litigation, and through advocacy, I think that there has been a lot of movement and that we'll see a cleaner uh, PFOS-free work environment in the fire service. And um, I also think that um, what uh, Frank just said, that the free market, that the firefighters and the jurisdictions will demand to have this, and that will happen over the bargaining table. Um, they will demand to have that garment, and I think that the free market will also provide that in addition to the things that we just talked about. Um, specifically to the question about the fire retardants in the uniforms, um, the work that we've done, I don't believe there's any PFOS in the fire retardant, but the fire retardant brings a whole set of problems with trisses and different uh, problems with a whole different chemical that um, 
it is problematic, um, but we're not addressing that. But that that is another avenue of just chemicals in the fire service that the firefighters are exposed to. Brian, do you have a last question for our guests? For those that want to know more information, is there a particular site they go to or an 800 number or something like that can get more information to, to contact that? Well, our, our firm is PritzkerLevine.com. Uh, they can contact Rick uh, directly. He's probably the best way for a firefighter uh, to talk to another firefighter who also happens to be a lawyer. So uh, they can reach out to Rick and maybe Rick can post his contact information and his email. Um, the case that's going on in South Carolina is there is a website that is hosted there. And if people are interested in following that, they can follow it. It's, it's open to everyone. And it's AFFF-MDL.com. And it, admittedly, it's a lawsuit website hosted by lawyers, but there is a fair amount of information in there about what's going on in that litigation, which is sort of the primary lawsuit right now in the country dealing with AFFF contamination both foam and now all the turnout cases are there as well. So people can look there. Um, and I know Diane has a site and there are other sites that are popping up by people who are, um, you know, who are following this issue pretty closely and posting stuff. I know we, Diane has, Cotter has a site that has a trove of information. Are you guys involved in the legislation um, at all? We are not, uh, you know, we, we, we try to stay in our lane. Um, we're advocates for our clients. Um, so that's what, that's what we're focused on, you know, advocating their cases. Chief Holland, do you have a last question for our guests? Not a, not a last question, but I did want to say thank you so much. That was very informative and, and uh, very much appreciate your efforts and what you're doing and <clears throat> for firefighters and, and, and you're measured and, and obviously um, very professional tone. So, and I know um, the, the old joke, I always thought talk was cheap until I met a lawyer. That, that, just kidding. But, but it's nice to know that folks like you uh, are out there, you know, with covering our six, because, uh, you know, um, it, it's just really re refreshing. And, and thank you so much for what you're doing. And, and, uh, and, and I hope that, that we hear more from you in the future as this progresses and, and there's more uh, to reveal so that people know that maybe there's avenues for regress, you know, for redress to their injury and, 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 and so that firefighters in the future don't get sick. Cause that's, that's the goal. The, the goal is that nobody else gets cancer unnecessarily uh, you know, other than a genetic kind of thing, which happens to people. So uh, on, on behalf of myself, as someone who's been watching this closely and has been in many conversations that were confusing, you guys were great. I, uh, you were, easy to understand and, and I'm very grateful for you. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's been, you know, I, I will say, it, you know, I've been litigating for 30 years. It's really been an honor representing firefighters. It really has been. They're a wonderful bunch of people. I'm sorry they're in this situation and we certainly hope to help them. Rick, do you have a last word for the program? So I do. I, again, I want to thank uh, you, Frank, for reaching out to me so we could have this conversation and Bobby to go and hosting this. I think, again, the information that's getting out is critical to hear this. And I think most people have to hear this multiple times before it, it really sinks in that this is an issue. So I'm grateful for the, the forum to, to speak. Um, I think the really take home message for me, for any firefighter who's listening and for the firefighters who are listening, especially for the guys who are um, injured in terms of who have a cancer or who survived a cancer, you, you need to go and seek um, legal counsel sooner than later. There is a statute of limitations that runs. Each state is different. And I'm just gonna say on a very high level that, um, that you only have so much time to go and file a complaint if you were to file a complaint. So um, the only way to do that is to reach out to counsel and, um, and don't sit on your rights. Is, is really the message here. Um, so I'll be happy to speak to anybody, but obviously we cannot, Pritzker Bean can't represent the, the entire fire service. This is not a class action lawsuit, but we could certainly get you in the right direction or get you a place or help you along the way to do that. But there's many firefighters who need to hear this and who are sick and have a direction to go. And so seek counsel. 
Well, thank you both for coming on today. This was a very cogent conversation and I personally got a lot out of it. And both of you just really kind of in a very measured way laid out the facts of this. And um, if it's okay with Bobby, PJ and I will write up an overview of the whole show today. And then maybe we could put some of those links in so that people could get additional information um, on behalf of politics and tactics and um, Bobby's here. So he can speak for fire engineering. We appreciate you coming on today and uh, look forward to talking to you in the future, Rick. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, John. Thank you, Rick. We're going to move directions here a little bit today, and we're going to talk to Brian Sky Eagle. First off, he is a district chief, deputy chief of the Houston Fire Department. Um, Houston Fire Department is the fourth largest fire department in America. That's a pretty uh, unbelievable distinction. I'm, I'm friends with your fire chief, so I'm sure he'll be watching today to make sure Brian represents uh, Houston in the most positive light. But Brian was appointed as the Department Resilience Officer. Now, we just did FDIC reviews, and I'm only a very small, tiny cog in that wheel. But if I had to take a drink for every time somebody used the word resilience or warrior in their proposal, I wouldn't be able to drive. So it's nice to we're going to actually talk to somebody who has the position who can explain to me what it is and what it does. He's also on the IF sees terrorism and homeland security committee and unfortunately with the events in afghanistan regardless of where you stand on those events politically i think it's going to be time to double the guard and america's got to be prepared because you know a lot of our troops out there who i have the highest respect for are questioning their service in afghanistan there's no need to question your service for the last 20 years america hasn't been attacked by at home and I think it's largely because of your efforts in Afghanistan. So please don't question your service. You're, it's a duty to your country. And, you know, me and my family, where I never served, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for putting the country ahead of yourself. Uh, Brian is also a lawyer and he's got a new book out. So, uh, and he's the president. Is that the proper term, president of the Houston Fire Chiefs Association? Yeah, uh, Chief Officers Association. Okay, Chief Officers Association. So it's an honor to have Brian in. Brian's somebody I've known for about a year now, and he, I hold him in the highest esteem. I've been very impressed with every time that I talk to him, and I, I it's great to be able to introduce him to uh, the fire engineering community. So, uh, Chief, uh, why don't we start off by, well, let's just call it out. Explain your name. Because we're going to get, get questions because I think it's a high honor to have a name like that. But our, our viewers are lo saying, Brian Sky Eagle. So, so explain your name and then we'll move into your new position in the Houston uh, Fire Service, if that's okay. You bet. And thank you for the, the kind words and, and nice introduction. So Sky Eagle, my daddy gave it to me. Uh, <laughs> but it's Ottawa Indian um, from Ottawa, Canada. We have a band in Grand Traverse, Michigan. I'm not from Michigan. I'm a I'm a Houstonian. I'm a local. I'm a, I'm a Texan. But there was a time when a lot of Ottawa Indians migrated down to Oklahoma. And in a recent Supreme Court case, they gave like half the state of Oklahoma to the Indian Reservation. Well, Ottawa's part of that deal, right? So I'm gonna have to make my way up there and see what's see what's left. Uh, but it's it's interesting because as I do more geology uh, genealogy, you start to know more about your family. I encourage everyone to do that. Like for us, we're not on. Um, uh, Ancestry.com, we have to actually go to the federal roles because people were put on reservations. We have to find things like that. So it's unique. But what I found out is I had a bunch of uncles that fought for the Confederacy <laughs> in the Civil War, which I thought was interesting um, because of that name. It's, a, it's an easy name. And real quick, it's actually an English equivalent. You know, they were uh, what I what I did in my search, talking with my family members. There was a time when they were put onto a certain reservation and it was a U.S. soldier. I don't know how to speak the Ottoman language, but I have a, a photocopy of where they signed in of the Ottoman language, and a U.S. soldier identified it as Sky Eagle. So it's some it's a, it's an it's an interesting translation. Um, but yeah, it's it's something uh, you know both in the fire service and the courts. You know they're going to remember it. Sometimes it works for you. Sometimes it works against you. Uh, but. Um, it is. It's an honor to have it and, and to represent 
I don't do much work with the native uh, community. We don't have a big presence here in Houston and in Southeast Texas. We don't have a big presence. We used to, but, um, you know, we had the Alabama Cachada uh, Indian Reservation. We don't do gambling in Texas, but it's just not as much as other states. But it is, it is an honor to be part of that community. So. And um, I, echo, I echo that, Brian, as a uh, resident in Indian Territory, as we like yeah. to call it. Um, as it was originally called, and uh, a proud, proud resident here, and uh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people. And my, to my cousin Matthew, who is full uh, 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 Indian, full Native American, actually uh, part Canadian, uh, what they call First Nation, and American, Native American, um, tip of the hat, because uh, great culture, everybody should be proud of their culture and their heritage, and um, the, the, uh, and the wonderful thing about America is, you know, everybody's got a little bit of everything. A, a quick story. I, I picked up my ancestry DNA thing about 10 years ago, eight, 10 years ago. My mom at the time was like 90 and I called her cause I was surprised. I knew we had some native American, knew we had Spanish, knew we had Irish. And I saw some Asian, like about 8%. And I said, mom, what the heck's the deal with this? I said, I knew the native American and all the other stuff. She said, Hey, jackass, your family's been here since the 1700s. We slept with everybody. <laughs> and I was like, okay, there you go. She goes, we never cared about that stuff. You kids are the ones obsessed with this stuff. And she just went, click. Yeah. Hey, jackass. I was like, okay. <laughs> well, I think my grandmother called me jackass. <laughs> never question your mother, you know, no. out of many, one. And that's yeah, what my, my, my mom did not suffer fools lightly. She was, she was a tough gal. Oh, that is, that is, well, that's, that conversation took a turn. Um, oh, yeah. But that's what makes America great out of many one, right? We're supposed to be all one people in the end. Um, we are. So, our, our unity is what makes us great. And we're all proud to be Americans and what this country stands for and always will be. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Chief, could you explain, because you're the only one in America that I think has credibility to explain this, <laughs> um, what's the resilience officer? Uh, so here in Houston, uh, Mayor Turner is, is, is part of the 100 City Resilience. It's a big document put on by the Rockefeller uh, organization where they direct funds to city that try to do uh, infrastructure and things like that to help uh, both recovery after natural disasters, prevention, mitigation, things like that. So when that came here to Houston, um, I was asked last year to, to take that appointment and, um, and Chief McLeod and Chief uh, Pena, were, you know, I'm honored to have that and they appointed me on that. So sitting down with Chief Pena, uh, he, you know, I thought he's, he's a very intelligent guy and when he sat down and said, what, what are our goals as a fire department? And around this time, we were, we were looking at right after the, we had a winter storm Uri down here. And we've encountered a bunch of infrastructure damage, I guess you could say, or hidden problems that we didn't know were problems yet. But the storm revealed that. Uh, for instance, when, when main water lines break, you know, we're not accustomed to that down here because we don't experience many freezes. Um, when you lose all communications except the alerting system, how we... Uh, keep fire stations open, the, the data and the communications that has to happen between fire stations and our operations center. Um, and then generators, you know, what generators are tied to natural gas lines, which of, them, which of them require fuel dumps from our fleet. And when the roads are frozen, you can't get fuel to the generators. So we were experiencing things and, and Chief Penny identified the top three things for our fire department that he wanted me to work on. One of them was to um, retrofit our generators, make sure we all get on a secured fuel type or fuel delivery system that will survive many days without relying on a fuel dump. Uh, the second one was um, the, the water lines, you know, so, I, so I'm in conversations with different departments of the city and there's about 20 different ones we meet each month. And so in this case, I'll be talking to the water department about how we can do some infrastructure to tie us to a main water line and not some of these branches that, that, that typically freeze or break. And then the last one, which, which I'm currently on, we just signed a project charter between us and the uh, IT people for Houston. And that is to get a secondary or redundant communication system. And so the alerting system, we didn't lose, 
but cellular service, uh, computer links, Wi-Fi, all that kind of stuff. We only had one service, which was Verizon. And now we're, we're moving forward to putting in a, a more robust communications where we can get laptops and we can communicate by laptops. We can communicate by multiple cellular services, not just one, because if you lose that one, uh, that, like we did for a while, we can't communicate with each other. And to try to keep the radios as free as much as we can. We don't want to take up the radio space uh, because we did have radios, but not for the internal. Thing. We want to keep that for the emergency response. Yes, sir. Bobby. Right. And so when you're talking about communications in particular, does it make sense then for fire stations in particular to keep their landlines? Because the landlines operate on a different, as I understand it, the landlines operate on a slightly different system than the cell phones. Absolutely. So what we encountered was who maintains those landlines, right? We got 100 stations here in Houston. And we call them the red phone, fire phone, uh, and each one has that. But things change. People will come into the stations and do work. They have to move things out the way. They may remove that phone and not put it back. It gets moved. So we had, you know, and then it's self-powered. That's the other thing. These landlines have their own power source. And we kind of use that, but it's just a, a handheld phone, right? There's no data link. We can't send um, communications and data between each other. But to receive a dispatch, absolutely. They can call down to the station and, and, and give us an address. And we want to go a little bit further than that and, and get reliable data links to where we can communicate each other through while the emergency is happening. I know the one I was working, I worked uh, Winter Storm Bury, and there were some stations uh, that turned into a shelter. I'm sure with any, with any natural disaster, they, they kind of turn into a shelter. And one of the most interesting ones that we encountered was we had to fill up um, coolers for the hospitals to keep the hospitals open. And that was a new job that the fire department took on because uh, we could get access and run, you know, uh, a pumper over there to pull it up, to fill it up. So I said, it takes us an hour to fill it up because the water service was so low, but it keeps that hospital open for six hours. So we started running shuttles and that was something very interesting that, that, that was a new job that popped up. So that increased, uh, I know Chief Pena made it very, um, you know, aware of the city people. That's how important these water lines are, that they took on a completely different use to keep hospitals open uh, during during the, the winter storm. So I thought that was a, a very insightful uh, goal for resilience. But so resilience for the fire service to us um, and under the direction of Chief Pena, it's really how do we keep this fire service open? How do we keep open for business? How do we uh, increase and, and make these fire stations and our service more robust to not only operate during the emergency, but right after the emergency to get the community back up. Does that well, help, Frank? <laughs> I think that explains it perfectly. And I, <laughs> I've always said that I think that the one blind spot most fire departments have is planning. You know, we're well, great you know, we, used spots, to, so. we used to turf this off on either the logistics officer or the quartermaster, and it became an ancillary function. And, and, and I probably should say in full disclosure, I'm a dear friend of your bosses also. So I think, you know, Sam's an old and dear friend. So I probably should say that at the outset. And I don't care because he's a great guy and my buddy. But um, the, 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 the idea of having a resilience officer, there's so many other things. I mean, we just, we just I think, it, it, as you know better than anybody, Brian, it, we've just got the tip of the iceberg because communications is just the most obvious. But as you go down in, in the resilience, you know, how resilient are you? you know, to all social contagions and things of that nature, which are also something to be concerned about. And, and so um, my hat's off to you and, and, and it's scalable, right? Like in other words, Brian's representing the fourth largest fire department in the United States. And, and you also have an amazing uh, system. And I always get it wrong. I always say Audrey, but it's not Audrey. Your, your, your communication system within your dispatch center for triaging calls and managing uh, EMS and such. Right. Very, 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 very elegant system. And, and uh, anyway, a, a model for the country. But it, this is scalable, right, Brian? And, and hopefully, I'd love to have you write about it for us. I'd love to have you come speak at FDIC about it, because I think that all of us are becoming more and more aware. Our, 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 our almost myopic dependence on the internet and, and electronic uh, modem, you know, high-end electronic modem is not not a great idea, uh, you know, because locally disasters can happen of, of epic dimension as the weather issue in Texas, which was just epic, you know, 
And, and Absolutely, Bobby. And let me tell you, uh, when I first took this role, I didn't know what to do. I reached out to L.A. Our chief resiliency officer at the time uh, came from California. She was their chief resiliency officer about the four years before she came to Houston. So she gave me a lot of contacts in L.A. I reached out to them. And to speak to your scalability, one of their concerns was water, uh, the amount of water, right? So they installed these uh, barrels underwater to collect water. I mean, barrels underground to collect water, to do their sprinklers, to do um, stuff around the station. Of course, it's not potable water, but they supplemented their water use. For us, it would be kind of flushing the toilets during a freeze when you don't have water pressure, right? That would be one of those. So when you apply that to your local area, we don't have those type of buildings. You know, we have these uh, square buildings, no pitched roof, and, it's, and they don't have outgoing spouts. So this is one thing we looked at. How can we supplement our water use when the water pressure disappears on a freeze? And it didn't work for us to put in barrels or gravity tanks because the buildings are not set up for that. So we have to get with the water department about another thing. But it's certain stations, different locations. It's not across the board. Some are just fine in the freeze. So, but Bobby, I did want to echo about Chief Ping. I think he's an amazing chief. I think he's introduced us to this idea of data and how important data can be to, to identify a problem. So, so thank you for doing that and bringing that up. He, you know, he's the kind of guy when, when you're coming to his town and you get off the plane and, and, and even if you told him don't do it, there's one of his guys or gals waiting for you with a little sign, Halton, get in the car. <laughs> my, my boss will kill me if you don't get in the car. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and it, it's that kind of old school elegance. He's, my mom would have called him an upstanding New York gentleman, although he's from yeah. Texas. Um, she would have she would have granted him that title, which which for her was the epitome of, you know, a compliment. And and and, and Sam is that kind of a gentleman. And, and it definitely takes his hospitality. But you know, and, and Bobby, I just put out a newsletter last month about resilience to let everybody in our member in our department. So we got different about six different projects we're looking at, right? Well, send send it to us and we'll put it up on fire engineering. I'm sure I'm sure yeah. if, if it's okay with the department. I'm sure yeah, I'll clear it through Chief Pena, but absolutely. Yeah, ask the boss and we'd love, you know, or ask the boss for a version that we can post up so folks can, you know, wrap their heads around this a little more, more deeply. And I know all the training officers are pulling their hair out right now saying, Halton, they're going to give it to me. They'll have to do this too. Everything goes to the training officer. Everything goes to the training guy. Everything. <laughs> or gal. He's, you know, it's just, it just it, it's inevitable. Now, now, Brian, you just got a book that came out on Texas disaster law as well, correct? Yeah, so um, my first day as a district chief in District 45 was the first day of Hurricane Harvey. <laughs> oh. So <laughs> when I showed up, I brought a hurricane with me, right? And we worked for four straight days uh, with crews I didn't know quite yet and districts I didn't quite know. And it was an incredible life experience. Uh, we ended up setting up area command when we could which took two days to even get out of the, the, the flooded island we were on. But, um, you know, to go back to what Jonathan said, the, the incredible spirits of people that you work with in these times. So before FEMA showed up, before all the resources started coming in, we had to rely on ourselves. And we were picking up Coast Guard guys that were crashing their planes and their boats. Um, we, took, we were setting up shelters, all with the guys that you're working with. And that was an incredible experience. And we, I think we bonded for life after that. But out of that experience, just having that legal background, we were doing so many things uh, that I've never done before because you had to fill in the gaps of how you're going to serve that community, how you're going to help people. And I had a driver that actually knew the back roads to get around. And I'm like, wow, that, how lucky did I get with that? Because he, he was from there. He spent the last 15 years in that district. He knew all these back roads to get us places. And I'm like, wow, like, you know, I need, I need, to promote you some kind of way, because that's what made all the difference for us to go get information and in what we're trying to do. And just to back Brian up a little bit here, if you've never been to Houston, it's a city, but it's almost like a county. I mean, yeah. it is huge. How many geographic miles are you guys? Uh, you know? what, what I recall about 690 square miles. Yeah, that, okay. Huge. Yeah. yeah. That's Rhode Island, <laughs> Vermont, and parts of Connecticut. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, that's, that's a big, big place. And, so, and, I'm yeah. Sorry, go ahead, no, no. I mean, uh, you know, like we think of L.A. County geographically. Um, that's a massive, massive fire department. But you guys are you guys are not only are you massive, but you've got coastal. You've got it's just a, if you want to go for a, a great 
if you're a firefighter and, 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 and you guys have a great hospitality uh, mantra and you go to Houston, don't hesitate to stop into the houses and, and, and you know, introduce yourself and the guys and gals will be happy to just show you what the complexity of that organization is just phenomenal. It's just phenomenal. And, and when Brian says knowing a district, trust me, you know, you, it, it, it's amazing when you're in that town. I was driving with one of your battalion chiefs and we were going across the city. And I said, so when are we gonna hit the city limits? He said, we're not. <laughs> and it was a good 45 minute drive. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, it, it, 600, 700 square miles. It's massive. So yeah, no, no doubt. Um, and we have what we call strip annexing in here, here in Houston. So You'll have a pocket of the city, and then you'll go in the county, and then another pocket of be the city. So we, we're very spread out like that. Right. That's right. You've got to... cities inside of Houston. That's right. right. I stayed in a hotel, and they said, you're in a... So, oh, I'm not in Houston. Because, oh, no, we're, there. we're surrounded. I'm yeah. like, you know, like, boy. That's it. That's it. Yeah. So working that, um, you know, I, I was doing some things I've never done, and I had all these questions, uh, Frank, and I thought, maybe we need to know a little bit more about this. And my idea was to create one of those little short flip books and things and say, hey, when can I take property? Hey, when can I get that school bus? You know, because I, I commandeer a school bus to transport people. So I was always kind of curious how far the badge went, right, <laughs> when I'm doing all this. So I got with the University of Houston's Law Center, and I said, you know, there's nothing quite like this, and, and Texas is unique. We have a homeland security law, which is a lot different from our emergency management law. And they kind of run parallel. They some overlap, but they run parallel. And um, what orders? So interesting. On on one of the floods, uh, our county judge said everybody with boats come on. But our mayor said, wait a minute, who are we going to be liable for that? Right? But if I bring them onto my team and I send them out to to do calls, right? Because I'm doing area command. Have we just now made them some type of contract employee or stuff like that? So I was curious, do I follow the county because he's sending all these people or do I follow the mayor and saying, hold up, keep them on the side, use our own people first. Uh, so I went to the uh, law school. It was a great project. Uh, the, the professors loved it. They got the funding. They got some students to do the research. I did a lot of interviews with a whole bunch of fire chiefs, emergency managers, things like that to, to see what the issues are. If they thought like I did, wrote this book. I thought it was going to be an article and something else, but they actually wanted to turn it into a book. So it's available on Amazon. It's through the university. You know, I don't get anything for that. I'm just a co-author uh, with two other ones. Um, but uh, Tracy Hester was a lawyer. They all did all Petro Kemp. And that's a big thing down here. So if there's a leak, he's the guy you want to defend you, right? <laughs> and then, uh, so so the professors are great. They, they, they really welcomed it. it was, we wanted to get it out a year ago, but COVID put that on stop. Uh, to get it out before hurricane season. I'm glad to say we got it out before hurricane season or actually when the hurricanes are starting to hit our area that that is, but it was a fun project and I'm glad we were able to do it. So if you could uh, send us a, uh, that, uh, a link to it, I'll make sure that Pete, Pete puts that up. Pete would be happy to put that up at the bottom of this feed. So if you want to get a copy of Brian's book, there'll be a link to, uh, to how to get to it. Great, thank you. We ran a little long today with our first segment. So Brian, we're gonna invite you back um, okay. on our next uh, edition. And uh, your chief's definitely gonna be watching because I believe your chief is gonna be the guest along with you. So Great. we'll have the two of you for the full, full hour. And then we'll talk about the chief's association and some of the other things you got going on. We really appreciate your patience today. I think the first segment was very important and we wanted to make sure that they had an opportunity to say everything that needed to be said. So we thank you for coming on the Politics and Tactics. To our viewers, we're not done yet. Um, we recorded a quick interview with Frank Siller, who lost his brother in 9-11 and started Tunnels to Towers. Now, I, I covered a little bit in the intro, but I really think you should listen to this. And you know me, I'm the, the career skeptic. I look into everything. I went through their 990s. I went through their tax documents. I went through everything. The, the charity's up and up and he doesn't even take a, he doesn't even take a salary. And unlike government bureaucracy and all the bureaucracies we see where they get bigger each year for their administrative costs and what they're given to 
buy homes, it's actually gotten better each year. So they're 100% on Charity Navigator for accountability and uh, transparency for their accounting. So um, if Pete could uh, cue this up and that's it for uh, PJ, myself, and Bobby Halton today. Bobby, we're going to give you the, the last word. And then as soon as you're done talking, if Pete could cue that up. But it, it's a great interview with Frank Siller. And I really take the time to watch it. A great guy. Bobby? Thank you for again for putting together a great show, uh, Frank and PJ. You guys are wonderful. Um, phenomenal guests. Uh, you know, we, I, we can't be more grateful when you have people, uh, you know, like Jonathan and Rick willing to come on and Brian willing to come on and share their valuable time. Uh, we don't, we don't take that lightly. So, and, and obviously Frank and PJ who are very busy. We, we just, we love you and we appreciate you. And just to echo what Frank said, if you're going to donate to some uh, cause, you can't go wrong with Tunnels to Towers. Uh, the, the work that they do is amazing. We, we personally, fire engineering myself, you know, several firefighters who, um, whose families were, were taken care of by uh, Tunnels to Towers and the amazing work that they do, took care of their, their, their mortgages, paid off their mortgages, which meant the difference between those people keeping their homes and losing their homes. And, and it's horrible enough to lose your husband or your dad or, or, or your wife, uh, but to lose your home in the same blow uh, is, can, can be just devastating. So uh, the, the Stiller family are an amazing group of people. And Frank, Frank is really the guy you see. Um, I've known him for a long time now. And he, really what you see is exactly who he is. And uh, please think about it's $11 a month. And that's all they ask for. And if you can afford it, it I would just urge you to support Towns to Towers. Some tactics today. We have a special pre-recorded segment today, and we don't normally do that on politics and tactics. But we wanted to be considerate of a great charity and a great man that's putting forth a legacy of his brother, but also a legacy of all firefighters that served on 9-11 and our soldiers. You know, our, our firefighters went into the towers and our soldiers went out around the country. And this is a charity that speaks to both of those things. Today, we have Frank Siller on with us. If you've been watching TV this week, last week, he's walking from Washington, D.C. Well, I'm going to let him tell you what he's doing. So, Frank, but first, can you just tell us a little bit about your brother? Sure. Stephen was a New York City firefighter who on September 11, 2001, was on his way home actually to play golf with myself, my brother George, my brother Russ. Uh, he was just finished his night tour in Squad One in Brooklyn, and he heard on the, uh, his scanner that the towers were hit. So he turned his uh, he turned his truck around, went to his to the firehouse, got his gear and drove to the mouth of the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. And I'm sure most people uh, are familiar with that tunnel. It's almost two miles long. He uh, it was closed for security reasons. So he strapped 60 pounds of gear on his back and ran through that uh, tunnel, uh, came out the other side. When he came out the other side, he wanted to help and help by saving lives and got into what we believe was the South Tower. He was never recovered, but his other uh, 10 other squad one brothers were also lost in, in the South tower. And you wouldn't want to uh, be where you, where your company is that you train with every day. So anyway, while, while saving others lives, he gave up his own. So we were so moved, uh, uh, by what he did that day as a family, he was the youngest of seven. He was our little baby brother. Uh, when he was born, uh, my father was 49. My mother was 44. He's our little miracle. And um, and uh, to think about what he did uh, on 9-11, uh, we wanted to make sure we honored uh, the sacrifice. But not just what he did, because you said in the opening, what we do for all firefighters and first responders and our, and our, our, our men and women in uniform all over the country. Uh, and that's that's what we've been doing for 20 years. And what I really like about your charity is it's tangible. It's something that you can touch. When you pay off, when your charity pays off, somebody's mortgage, it does a couple things. One, it remembers the person who went to work thinking that they were coming home and, you know, we'd all like to think everybody comes home, but that's, that's just the slogan. So when we go to work and firefighters in, in the military and they go to work every day, they want to be remembered 
They want to do their duty for their country, their town, their community. But they also, the most important thing that we see, and we just saw in Howard County with the firefighters last transmission, when he was talking about his family, we want to know that our families are taken care of. And the work that you're doing to pay off somebody's mortgage, to give them a home, gives firefighters a peace of mind, but also carries on that legacy. I'd like to bring in PJ Norwood on this. He just came on our co-host. We're talking to Frank Siller. And uh, PJ, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. And I, and I greatly apologize uh, for being a little late. And Mr. Siller, I deeply apologize for, for being late in this show. Uh, you're somebody I've looked up to uh, for, for a long time. I've, uh, I've run in the Tunnel to Tower race in New York City. Nothing. Uh, the, the, the first time I ran through it, I was literally moved to tears coming out of the tunnel where 340, actually more than 343 brothers were holding the full length posters of brothers and sisters who were lost on September 11th and literally moved, moved to tears coming out of that tunnel. Um, so to experience that firsthand, to run in the Tunnel of the Towers race, and then to see what you continue to do and how you continue to give back um, in memory of your son is amazing. Um, I was speaking with Frank this morning, and I was just traveling uh, to Chicago, came home, and during that travel, I watched a small video clip, uh, I hate to say an advertisement, but an advertisement for, the, for your organization on the Tampa Project. Oh, yeah. You're not only giving back and helping with mortgages, you're building a community, a community. And, and I don't know if some people realize the, how big that is. You're not, you know, you're not building somebody, you know, an 800 or square hundred foot home and you're paying off their, their mortgage of what's left or, you know, giving them a gift card to go pick up some groceries. You're building a community in Tampa, Florida. You're building a community to give back for those that have given so much. Um, and, I, and I have so much honor and respect for you for, for what you do and anything that, that I can do to continue supporting that mission and helping you. Um, I'm all in. So thank you for giving your time today. And again, I apologize for, uh, for being late. Uh, uh, thank you, PJ. And you, and you are doing it by having me on here today. You're spreading the word that uh, the goodwill that we do and the good work that we do. Uh, so thank you for coming. You're right. When you come to the Tunnel to Towers run and you're surrounded by 2,500 West Point cadets that run through the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel chanting USA and, and their cadence. Uh, you see all the injured service members that uh, uh, are at our run every year. They're, they run through double, triple amputees. They run through, through the tunnel. Uh, it's very uh, uplifting and inspiring. And then you're 100% right. When you come out of the tunnel and you see all the first responders, the pictures of all of them that died that day, life size pictures, like you said. Uh, and then when you see the 7,059 pictures of our men and women in uniform that served our country since 9-11, that died for us, for our freedoms and our liberties and our protection here to protect us so we don't have another 9-11. Uh, we hold all those pictures of, of all these great heroes. So it's nearly a mile long of all the pictures of, of all these great uh, Americans that died for, for you and I. Yep. And coming out of the tunnel that first time, I didn't think I had it enough left in me to continue running because you know, I really didn't prepare too well. And when you when I came out of that tunnel to be inspired by that part at that towards the end of the race there um, or end of the run um, was amazing. Something I'll, I'll always remember. My daughter's 19 this year and she was with me that year. And for her to remember that and just to for her to remember going through and high fiving everybody. Um, and seeing those pictures, it's just amazing. So uh, I, I can't say it enough. Now, Frank, you've been running now for a couple of years uh, since you retired. You've been, you've been getting in better shape than I have. Um, I definitely think you need to head to New York and, and get involved in that race and do it. We'll do it together. Um, I, I accept that challenge. I think I'm kind of like a Clydesdale. PJ is more like a gazelle, but fit in with our family. Don't worry. It's a, it's a worthy, worthy cause. And PJ, you were thrown off by Frank's hair. Um, we're talking about his brother and all the brother and sister firefighters out there. So I thought that was pretty funny. But Frank, what's the walk been like? Because, you know, a lot of charities, they do this gimmick, that gimmick. It's about the end result of helping firefighters and soldiers out. But I think that the walk was a great idea because it's been on the news everywhere. I just was in Washington, D.C. Um, for the last week. And it was all over the TV in Washington, D.C. It's been on the TV up here in Connecticut. So I think the walk 
is actually helping to raise awareness and it's getting individuals talking about the charity who normally wouldn't be talking about it. So how has the walk been going? So look, I started August 1st at the Pentagon. I laid a wreath there with my family and many other uh, families that join me, Gold Star families, fallen first responder families that, that walked with me the first few days. Um, it was uh, very emotional to say the least. I hence have walked to the Pentagon. Um, I laid a wreath there this past Saturday, August 21st um, with uh, a Flight 93 uh, family member, uh, along with 40 New York City firefighters that came up with me. And we went down to the exact spot where the impact was for Flight 93. Now, I'm going to say that was the first battle in the war on zero, on on terror, right? That was ground zero for them up in in, in Shanksville. They took down that plane. They took back that plane from from the terrorists, and they brought it down in the fields in Shanksville, and they saved Americans on the ground. And to be at that spot, they have a beautiful boulder right there. I not, I knelt down to say a prayer. I put my hand on the boulder. I and I had every firefighter came there and knelt down, and we said uh, the, the Lord's prayer there at that point. And I'm going to tell you, it was one of the most emotional moments in, in my in my whole life. And now I'm heading back towards uh, New York City. I'll be there on September 11th, uh, retracing my brother's final heroic footsteps. I'll be doing it with sneakers on. He did it with his fire gear on. 60 pounds of gear. I'll be doing it knowing I'm coming out the other side to remember he did it coming out the other side and gave up his life, knowing that he was running into a building that was on fire. Um, But I'll be doing it to make sure that we never forget. So Frank, you're right, PJ, you're right. This walk is uh, to make sure that we never forget. Families are talking about what I'm doing um, because uh, that's the point. The point is that Parents talk to their children because God knows they don't do it enough to tell the real story of, of 9-11, that uh, Islamic terrorists try to kill as many Americans as possible, but they did kill 2,977, and we can't let that happen again. And they'll, never, and they'll never kill the American spirit, and your organization is helping bringing that forward and helping out firefighters, soldiers, and more importantly, we always look to helping out our families. So, PJ? And Frank, and your message is so, so important, um, not just, you know, 19 years ago, but also today, because as we're seeing now in, in my new role as a director of training in, in Connecticut, our recruit class is coming in the end of this month, just about all of them, if not all of them, were probably not even born yet September 11th, or they were very, very young. So they didn't live through that day, like I lived through that day, or Frank lived through that day. So it's up to us right? To continue making sure that they know what happened that day and not know the story from the media. They know our, the real story of what happened that day and what happened to really good people like your son who gave up their life for this country in New York City on that day. So without people like yourself spreading this message, yes, you're doing wonderful things for the community and giving back and raising, raising money. But even bigger than that is we're making sure that the next generation never forgets of what happened on that day and all the lives that were taken from us all too soon. So, for, so for that, we all need to make sure that we're diligent and remembering that the incoming firefighters may not have been alive or were too young to know what's going on. So it's our job and our responsibility to make sure the message of people like your son, Frank, are delivered to them. So they know who your son was and what he did for them. Well, thank you for saying that PJ. And here's the thing, our foundation Tunnel to Towers Foundation, the, our first mission from day one was to make sure we never forget and that we honor the sacrifice. Now, it just so happens we decided to honor the sacrifice by doing good. St. Francis of Assisi said, brothers and sisters, while we have time, let us do good. And that's how we live. That's how we make all our decisions at the Tunnel to Towers Foundation. And we're doing good by taking care of the greatest of all Americans, the families that are left behind of our men and women who pr- uh, protect us over, overseas, that serve our country, or our first responders here at, at home that protect us and give us a safe community. So we, the Tunnels of Towers Foundation has made a promise that when you go out to serve your country or your community and you give your kids a kiss goodbye and you don't come home, we're gonna make sure that we give their families that are left behind a mortgage-free home. And uh, that's why we want people to join us on the mission. Part of my walk is 
my hope is that I get a million people to join us on this mission of doing good and take care of the greatest of all Americans, those who will to die for you and I. And, uh, and if a million people donate $11 a month, because that's what we're asking for, $11 a month. You know, in the fire department, you know this, right, PJ? Many hands makes light work. And if I get many hands come together to take care of these families that are left behind, it'll be light work. We could take care of uh, all, all these families. Look, we're delivering 200 mortgage-free homes this year on the 20th anniversary. 200. You could do the math. Times your mortgage times 200, or we're building smart homes or building homes for gold star families. So 200 times those numbers is a big number. Uh, I don't wanna just deliver 200 homes because it's the 20th anniversary. I wanna deliver 200 homes next year and the year after and the year after and forever. And we could do that if, uh, if people come together and join us on our mission. Frank, I just wanna make something clear to our viewers. And you know, I'm always considered the skeptic, the guy that's brutally honest in the fire service. So. I did a lot of digging on this because this is the first time we've ever had a charity come on the show. And, you know, this is, this is about 9-11 and as horrible as it is, people profit off 9-11 and it's, it's just, it's disgusting. Your charity, I went through your 990s, I went through everything and everything looks legit. And if you go to Charity Navigator, the one thing that I'm very impressed about your charity is that the administrative cost and those things that are necessary. It costs money to make money. I truly recognize that. They've been getting bigger. Uh, they've been getting better each and every year. More money's been going out. So I just want to, I shouldn't have to, but I just want to thank you for being true to your brother's memory and to all those firefighters and soldiers to know that here's a charity that's moving in the right direction, that's doing it right, that's actually getting money into the hands of the mortgage companies to pay off people's mortgages, but that's firefighters aren't buying their houses cash. You know, the, our soldiers aren't buying their houses cash. We all and need that, fire. Go ahead. We all have mortgages. So it's and critical. Doing it for money. You're hundred percent. So hear this. I don't get paid. I am a volunteer like the thousands of volunteers that we have. Over 93 cents of every dollar goes to our programs. Over 93 cents. We're 100% rated in transparency. We're the highest rating that you could possibly get in Charity Navigator. But this is what I'm proud of. And you said it, every year we go up and up. Last year's tax return, 95.2% of every dollar went uh, to, uh, to our programs. And people could see where their $11 goes. When we pay off a mortgage or build a house, they could say, hey, I was part of that. My $11 made that difference. And, uh, and that's the incredible way that we work. We depend, we're a grassroots blue collar foundation. Yeah, I have the Home Depot, thank God. Yeah, I have General Motors, thank God. But most importantly, I have hundreds of thousands of people that have joined us and, and donate to us because that's how we get it done. And Frank, what's your website? So that if somebody watching today wants to go, $11 a month is a very small amount. You pay less than that in house fund at the firehouse. And this is something that God forbid ever happened to you is, you know, it's, it's a path. It's a way to be remembered. It's a way to take care of your family. Can you give the website? T2T.org. It stands for Tunnel of Towers, obviously. So T, the number two, T.org. PJ? I spend more per week in coffee. Exactly. Than eleven dollars per month. Cups of coffee. Give up a couple of cups of coffee, and you can uh, you can help a family that paid the ultimate sacrifice for for us. And I know, as first responders, uh, we're we're not making millions. We're making enough money to put food food on the table. But we're talking about eleven dollars. We all waste more than eleven dollars a day on things that we can live without. That eleven dollars a day is going to go to a family or families to give them something that they don't have that they deserve for what they've done for this country. Okay. So I appreciate, and I encourage everybody to, to dig in. You don't even have to dig deep. $11 a, a month is not a lot of money. So, so please consider, you know, where you're donating and donate to a, to an organization such as this, where you can see where your money goes to and 92 cents, not almost 93 cents per dollar goes directly into the hands of somebody that needs it and deserves it. And I welcome our, our viewers and listeners 
go to Charity Navigator, and then put in the five charities that come to mind. You're going to you're not going to be able to find a rating like this 100% for financials and transparencies. So I'm talking to my wife and I think I'm going to be donating $11 a month because I'm not right now. And uh, I said, I wanted to talk to the man himself who's bringing forth the legacy of his brother and helping out firefighters. Now, you not only help out firefighters, it's military and police, correct? Uh, absolutely. There was a police officer just killed the Kalamazoo. Uh, a couple of days ago, I already spoke to the widow. Actually, yesterday, I called the widow and I told her that uh, we're going to be paying off our mortgage. Uh, she has four children. And I, I talk to hundreds of widows a year and make those phone calls. And to every one of them, the, I mean, obviously, that is, they said, we did, I didn't know how I was going to stay in my house. That's their answer. I, I was worried. Yeah, they just lost a loved one. They're grieving. I mean, just think of what's, but in the ha head is, how am I going to stay in, in this house? And that, and we take that off of them. And I call them right away because I don't want them to worry. So within a couple of days of uh, a, a police officer getting shot and killed and God knows how many are, are, are dying, you know, protecting us or firefighters that are going into, uh, into a building and don't come out. Um, or if you are in the service and you're protecting our country and you give your life to your country, we're going to take care of your families. I mean, I don't think I'm so proud of our mission. And then believe me, we didn't think of this when we started it. God put us on a path. I'm not that smart, to be quite frank with you. But what I am is um, dedicated to my brother's legacy and um, as my family is. And we're going to make sure that we honor him in the best way. And he'd be very happy to know that we're taking care of these great Americans. It, it just, it just, this whole thing is just so, so sad, but it's such a wonderful thing that you're doing. Um, I just, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show, taking time. I, I know you're probably getting off the road midday, so that might be a, a little relief for you. I'm but, actually in the air conditioned room so now, so if we talked a little bit longer, it'd be all right. So, but, uh, <laughs> I'm going back out. It's 92 degrees. I'm going back out to do another uh, uh, at least six, seven more miles. I do about anywhere from 13 to 15 miles a day. And I will, like I said, be in New York uh, for uh, on 9-11 to commemorate the 20th anniversary. Well, it's all about remembering, but also taking care of each other. And that's what the military, the police department, and the fire department is supposed to, that's what we're supposed to be about. Um, PJ and I and your team are going to put together an article for this, for Fire Engineering Online, about our uh, podcast this, this week. And uh, we just want to thank you for coming on. And if you can give the website one more time. And as I said, I, I'm the skeptic in all of this when it comes to money. And uh, my wife and I are going to start donating to tunnels to towers because i think it means something and thank you, know. you and thank you bj for having me it's t the number two t.org that's t2t.org stands for tunnel to towers my brother ran through the tunnel to the towers and gave up his life on 9 11 so t the number two t.org thank you for having me thank you god bless right. thank god bless Bye -bye.